guys are having a good time. I'm having an amazing time. Uh, I'm really enjoying myself and uh, getting a lot out of this. I'm really excited about uh, our first lecture today. Uh, you know, I am one of those people who really, in, for most of my life, I, did, I wasn't really a sports person. You know, I think there's this, there is this kind of um, uh, gap between, uh, between game people and, and sports people still. Um, and it's kind of like a weird holdover from uh, high school politics, you know, the nerds and the jocks. Um, and I think I, you know, I was one of those nerds who just didn't get jocks and didn't get sports. Um, but as I've uh, grown older and as I've, as I've thought about games and made games more and more, I, it's become more and more clear to me um, how interesting uh, sports are, um, how, how, and how, how powerful they are to, as a, as a you know, not, not just as something to experience, but as something to think about um, and, uh, and to study and, and, and learn about and draw inspiration from. Um, I mean, I, I, sports are, uh, sports are, are there's, there's more going on there than, than it looks like from the outside. I think if you, you know, for me, one of the, one of the you know, uh, one of the things that changed my perception is, is the, the um, uh, fantasy uh, sports, fantasy football, fantasy baseball, and things like that, and realizing that uh, sports fans had a much deeper and richer engagement with the kind of uh, numerical and statistical and analytical side of what was happening in sports um, really kind of uh, was an illuminating thing for me. Um, sports, I think, are super relevant uh, to, to, to digital game design. Um, if you, I mean, sports are, are social games. Uh, sports are games as a service, not a product. And yet, there's still a big industry. There's still a big business, right? Um, sports are, in some ways, about uh, procedural content generation. Um, if you think about um, just the, the game six of the World Series that just happened, right? I mean, the 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 way that that game like produced these incredible moments, right? It's almost like um, sports are are like drama. Engines. They're like these little engines that produce this, these moments of intense and incredible uh, drama and suspense and, and excitement and emotion. Um, and um, I don't know, for me personally, I, I've always been, uh, I've always looked at, because I'm so ambitious. I'm ambitious for myself and I'm ambitious for the field of games. I think uh, uh, we all are, are, you know, feel, those of us who make games feel like we're, 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 in this process of making games more relevant as a form of culture, like more, you know, integrated into the lives of, of the of, of people, um, and you know, uh, having an, an impact on their lives. And and when I think about the, the the spectrum of of games and how they fit into culture, sports are such an amazing example of of the scope uh, that a game can have, the the impact that a game can have uh, on the lives of people. Like the, if you think of of how important uh, sports are in people's lives, in, in, in urban design, the way you know, cities are architected around you know, stadiums. People build their lives around uh, these games and draw a lot of uh, meaning from them. And, and, uh, and so to me, it's, a, it's an inspiration of, of you know, one of the ways that games can work as, as a huge, important, relevant, <laughs> meaningful part of, of people's lives and, and, and of culture. So. Um, I am incredibly excited uh, to uh, today to, to hear from uh, from Rogers Redding, and um, just to give you a, a brief uh, introduction of his background, um, uh, Mr. Redding is the national coordinator for officiating NCAA football. Um, he was previously the Southeastern Conference coordinator of football officials, and he is the secretary rules editor of the NCAA football rules committee and the author of uh, Redding's Study Guide to the NCAA Football Rules. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot. This, uh, one of the, 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 um, the little themes that has emerged, I think, out of, out of the, the first day of practice was the idea of game design as stewardship of, of uh, you know, the, the, the game designer as someone who's participating in the community of a game and, and guiding it. And I think in many ways, um, we're gonna hear today from uh, one of the principal stewards of the game of football. So please put your hands together for Roger Reddy. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. That's a wonderful introduction. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. I, I, um, 
I'm honored to be here, and I was very surprised when, when Frank called me because I know nothing about what you do. <laughs> and in fact, I, uh, yesterday, sitting through the, the panel discussion, I had this sense that I was entering a conversation that had started some time ago. And I recognized all the words as English, but beyond <laughs> that, I had no clue. Now, I, I, part of my background that you don't know about, I taught, I was a college professor of physics for 30 years. And um, so I did understand when Chris put up the linear and the quadratic equation. I got that part, <laughs> and I get the part about the, the line bending toward the abscissa when the, when, the, when the exponent is between 0 and 1. I can talk about that. But the rest of it just went right on by me. But I did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night, so there is hope for me. You know. <laughs> so, um, I, I hope I can contribute something to your conference. Um, if not, I'll just be satisfied to entertain you with my accent. Uh, as, as John Cleese said in Silverado, clearly I'm not from these parts. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like to, to talk about what I'm going to talk about, and that is um, what I'll do is, is I, I, it occurred to me that, that in talking about the development of the rules of football, uh, it would be helpful to talk about the history of the game a little bit. I don't want to d dwell on this a lot, but it's an interesting history, and the history of the game is the history of the rules, and vice versa. And so we'll talk about that. Uh, I want to talk about how the rules got started. How, creating and changing the rules, I think, is an, is an interesting process, and you may, want to, you may want to be sort of tuned in on that. And then I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up, and then we'll save some time for Q&A. I think any time you have a game, and, and I'm sure you do this with your games, and, and one of the things that's different, by the way, about what I do and what, and Frank touched on this, the games that you create are, are games that are participated in by the people that are, that are playing the games. Sports, you mostly watch. Now, the fantasy business enables people to watch and also participate. And, and, and fantasy sports, the NFL worries a lot about about how the films that they make of games, about how team films are accessible to people that are playing fantasy sports. They protect this stuff. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Uh, there's a whole nother, I mean, you're a subculture that I really don't understand. That's a whole nother subculture that I don't understand about fantasy games. It's just, it's an amazing thing. But anyway, the, the fundamental objective of football, if you think about it, if you, just, if you just strip away all the crowds and all the hoopla and all the stuff, the fundamental objective is to, is to kick or carry a ball beyond a landmark, we call that the goal, and prevent the opponent from doing the same. That's the fundamental idea. Now, how you do that and how many people you do that with and what the size of the field is and all that is going to be obviously up for, up for discussion. But that's the fundamental objective. Um, football has its origins in, in, in rugby and soccer. It's, it's, it's probably a lot more like rugby than it is soccer. What we call soccer, of course, you know this, everybody else in the world calls football. In fact, the, when, you, when you see the World Cup, it's the FIFA, and I don't know what all that means exactly in the language that it's in, but it's a football association. So the rest of the world calls it football. We got soccer from association football. The three letters in association are, were created to, to soccer. Rugby turns out its name for the town in, in England that, that the game is is played. And so if you look at a football game and you watch a rugby game, it looks a lot more like, they look a lot more like each other than soccer and football do. But anyway, the, the, the origins of football come from, from rugby and soccer. 1869, uh, football, it, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to trace this because for people have been, you know, kicking balls and, and, and hitting each other for a long time. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you, you can go all the way back to Roman times and probably before that. But the, but the first college game was in 1869, Rutgers 6, Princeton 4. There were 25 players on each team. Can you imagine? I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a, lot, a lot of people, 50 folks out there. The field was 125 by 75 yards compared with the 100 by 53. So that's 25% larger longer. Uh, the score, the only way you could score was to kick a ball between, between uprights. There was no crossbar, but the foot was very important and there was no clock. If you got six scores, you won the game. No clock and no, no, no what we would call a touchdown. There was no sense of that. It was all kicking the ball. And that's, I mean, football, if you think about it, the foot is, is almost incidental to the game of football anymore. You know, kickoffs and punts and field goals, but I mean in terms of the game itself, it's, it's, it's less that, and we'll see a reflection of that later on. 
1876 was an important year for lots of reasons, and I put some of them up here. Certainly, our, the centennial of the country was a, was a big deal. Um, there was a disputed presidential election that year, the hayes tilden election, where Hayes won the electoral vote by one and lost the popular vote. Custer was wiped out at Little Bighorn while Bill Hickok was killed. And oh, by the way, Yale beat Harvard one to nothing. This is the first college game that 11 players are on each team. That's the first one. And so that's, that's kind of a, a key one because, of course, that's the number of, of players that play now. Um, Again, in 1876 also, um, the Intercollegiate Football Association was formed. What, what would happen, and this probably happens with your, in your arena, when people were going to get together to play a game, think about how kids play a sandlot game now. You say, okay, that tree, and that, you know, that's the goal line, and out of bounds is this maple tree over here, and uh, that kind of thing. And so when, when Harvard and Princeton got together to play a game, the players would get together and say, okay, how are we going to do this today? <laughs> you know, and so we'd do it this way, and then, and then maybe Columbia would play Yale a week later, and they'd get together, and it'd be different. Well, they're talking to one another, and so they decided to form this rather grandly named uh, Intercollegiate Football Association, all of three universities, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I guess if it's, if it's more than one, it's intercollegiate, so. <laughs> um, but they wanted to develop a consistent set of rules, so what they did, um, the field was 140 by 70, compared with 100 by 53 now. Uh, 15 players on each team. Yale continued to want 11, and I'll, I'll talk about that, that a little bit later. For the first time, touchdowns were included in story. I'm always interested in words, and it was, it was always curious to me, why do we call it a touchdown? And it turns out that the rule was that if you, in order to score, you had to touch the ball, they would call it touch in goal or touchdown. You had to touch the ball to the ground. Now it just breaks the plane of the goal line, but it had to touch the ball down in the, in, the, in the end zone, to, and that was included in scoring. And, and this is of interest to me because I did it for so long. The referee, the first time the referee was included to settle disputes. Before that, and you've seen pickup basketball games, guys to say, okay, this is a foul, that's not a foul. You got fouled, no, I didn't get fouled, and so somebody decided. Well, things were getting so serious about this that they had to, had to have an arbiter step in. And so, but this is the, this is the sort of the, if you, if you had to talk about the beginning of modern football, this is probably, this is probably the, the beginning. Walter Camp. How many of you recognize the name Walter Camp? Walter Camp was, a, was famous as a, as a player at Yale and later coached. And he was, he was, I guess you could say, the first secretary rules editor. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a descendant of Walter Camp in a, in a sense, in, in the sense that he was the one that, that first began to sort of codify the rules. He wanted... Um, he, he wanted 11 players on each team. I'm not sure why. He says that if you read what he wrote, he wanted to open up, create more space on the field. If you had all 25 players on a team, you know, I mean, that's a lot of folks. And even 15, how he decided 15 versus 11, I'm not sure. But anyway, he, he finally won out. And, uh, and he also uh, introduced this, what, what was called at the time, the possession rule, which distinguished football. And they introduced this term scrimmage. <coughs> You hear the term scrum in football, and that's short for scrummage. And scrum is when in rugby. How many any of you play rugby? Okay, you know you more than one. Great. You know more about this. I'm probably going to misrepresent this. But basically, everybody gets around the ball, and they try to advance the ball down the field. And, and, and so they, they introduced the notion of possession where a team was allowed to keep the ball, and, and they could keep the ball the whole game. Which, which turned out to be a boring <laughs> situation. And, and, and if they kept the ball and they got backed up, they would back up into their, as a safety measure, back up into their own end zone. That's the origin of the term we use now for safety, which now counts two points. Didn't count anything then. Just allowed them to keep the ball. Well, there's a lot of scoreless ties. Now, I mean, there's nothing more <coughs> boring than, you know, you, you know, you, some, the old joke about the woman that comes into the, the baseball game and she gets there and, the, and it's the seventh inning and somebody, she says, what's the score? And somebody says, nothing, nothing. Oh, well, I haven't missed anything. <laughs> well, you know. So, uh, so the unintended consequence of that was boring games. And so that introduced the, in 1882, introduced the idea of downs. In other words, you, and they, you had three downs. And it, this is interesting. They had to advance either five yards or retreat ten yards. If you advance five yards and three downs, then you got another set of downs. If you retreated ten yards in three downs, you got another set of downs. And so what this led to was the need to strike, to paint stripes on the field at five-yard intervals. So that, because they had to have some way of measuring 
this five yards. And so that some writer derisively said, that makes this look like a gridiron. And so that so the name stuck. And so you'll hear you'll hear football. <coughs> sometimes you'll hear the game or the or the field referred to as the gridiron. And and, and the reason is because it has it has this five yard instrument paints. And the reason for that was the introduction of the notion of, of downs into the into the game. Okay. Um, the scoring system. This is this is interesting because I think it, it illustrates. And, and I, I don't I don't know how. In, in games that you design, I, I don't know how you do scoring, and I'm sure it's different for lots of different games. But if you notice, first of all, the elements of the scoring, this is in 1883, the elements of scoring are still with us, okay? We still have a safety. We still have a touchdown. This is what they call a goal after a touchdown, which means what they mean by what we call an extra point kick, okay? The goal, when they say goal, they mean kicking the ball through the goal. And so a goal after touchdown, and a goal from the field, we'd call it a field goal. And notice the point, the point count. Safety and touchdown, which means I'm, I'm holding on to the ball, I'm, I've got the ball in my possession, we're only in, in one point and two points. A kick, goal after a touchdown or a goal from the field was five and four points. So that says that the foot, the kicking was very important because they, they placed more value on that than they did on holding onto the ball. Now, I put the, in parentheses, I put the current values of these things now, the touchdown is worth two field goals, but in the old days, a field goal was worth two and a half touchdowns. And so the emphasis of the game has shifted away from the foot to running, passing, whatever, scoring, uh, uh, carrying the ball. So the importance of kicking was, was very, was very uh, prevalent in, in the early game. Well, um, the game between uh, it, in the 1880s, um, it, was, it was a very rough game. People that play rugby, um, I mean, I, my hat's off to you for playing rugby. That's a very, that's a very rough sport. Uh, people that are ruggers, as they call them, are, are, are you know, that, that's, a very, that's a very hard sport, very tough. I've never played it, so I, I know nothing about it. But um, it, it, got so, it was getting so bad, play, people were getting killed. I mean, games were just being uh, uh, terribly uh, dangerous. And so Teddy Roosevelt, if you want to read an interesting book, there's a book out recently called The Big Scrum, and the subtitle is How Teddy Roosevelt Saved Football. And it's a, it's a really interesting, it's, it's focusing on more on Roosevelt's life, but it also has a lot of the history that I'm talking about. And it talks about how Roosevelt basically got, got together Harvard, Yale, and Princeton presidents, and he basically said, look, Reduce the violence or there will be no more football. Because people were getting killed, the rules had to be changed. And so I put this in because your own chancellor, McCracken, uh, was very much involved. He, he, was, he wanted to eliminate football altogether. He and the president of Harvard. The president of Harvard and Chancellor McCracken were very much interested in just doing away with it altogether. And uh, so he was instrumental in, in the thinking that went on in, in, in he, he was not part of this group. But he was very instrumental in the thinking that went on. Football, by, by, the, by that time, had begun to spread. It, this is the, the cradle of football is in the Northeast, even though now in the South and the Southwest you hear more about it. But the cradle of football is in the Northeast. And, uh, and, and Harvard, uh, in fact, I'm going to get to go to the Harvard-Yale game this year for the first time ever. I'm really looking forward to that because that, that's the game. And um, so, uh, but it had begun to spread. Army had a team. Notre Dame, uh, about this time, a little, little later on, was becoming prominent. And I'll, I'm going to talk about Newt Rockne and his influence in a second. But it, it was at about this time that the Intercollegiate Athletic Association of, of the United States, this, this associate that had been formed earlier, that was the precursor to the NCAA. And the NCAA traces its roots back to 1905 and, and, the, and the institution that, that, that Roosevelt uh, produced. Okay, I love this poem that I found. Just read this. <laughs> his head was jammed into the sand. His arms were broken twain. Three ribs were snapped. Four teeth were gone. He ne'er would walk again. His lips moved slow. I stooped to hear the whispers let, they let fall. His voice was weak, but this I heard. Hey, man, who's got the ball? <laughs> so it was a violent game, but passionate. You know, people, I mean, all he cared about was what had happened. He, he was less interested in, in, his, in his demise. Um, 1906, following this, this sort of summit that, that uh, Roosevelt held, 
was the was really the beginning of, of uh, what we would more recognize as football. The forward pass was legalized. That's a whole interesting story of its own. Ten yards and three downs for a first down. This is now four downs, of course. The notion of downing a runner was was first um, uh, introduced here. Uh, player safety, unnecessary roughness was introduced. If you look at the rules, uh, the, the original set of rules of football, there are about 62 rules. The first five or six of those all talk about the kicking game. And player safety is down in about number 58 or 59. I mean, it just wasn't an issue. And, and people weren't concerned about it. And so it became more and more concern. Um, the, for the first time, the, the notion of a neutral zone and lines of scrimmage. So the game was becoming more and more codified, more and more uh, consistent with one, you know, playing from, from one institution to the next. And so, um, so uh, let me shift now to little, talking a little bit about how the rules are, are created and changed. And, and this is just a little brief. And, and again, to repeat, in the early days, it was just a pregame agreement among the players, like they do Sandlot basketball or football now. Just how are we going to do this today? Well, as you got more participants in the game and more people, more stakeholders, the institutions became stakeholders now and the people watching the game, then you had more government. That is to say you had more rules, more, more need for talking about rules and that sort of thing, and more need for consensus. I mean, everybody needed to agree in order to be able to, to make comparisons about one, from one game to the next and to know how, to, how we're going to play the game today. And so, and then in the, in the modern era, um, the NCAA Rules Committee came into existence and uh, it, is a, it traces its roots to, uh, to this committee that, that Walter Camp set up back in the, in the late 1800s. Uh, I want to talk about this a little bit because it's sort of, it, it's sort of where we are today. Um, there is a, it is a part of the NCAA organization and in all the schools in the NCAA agree to abide by the, the rules of, of football. Basketball and baseball and everything else, but we're talking about football. It is a, a non-federated rule structure. By that I mean, if you think about all the college football that's played in the, in, the, in the country, what's on TV all the time, of course, are the big guys, the Division I, Division, what used to be 1A and, is, and one, now 1AA, one and those are now referred to, why they came up with these names, I don't know. The football bowl subdivision and the football championship subdivision are the divisions of Division I. Then you got Division II and Division III. Division III is a non-scholarship, uh, playing for the fun of the game uh, uh, division, and all the all those are represented on the NCAA Rules Committee in equal numbers. So they're the same number: Division One, Division Two, and Division Three coaches. And by the way, the voting members are all coaches. The officials. I'm I'm on the committee as a non-voting member's rules secretary. There's always an a, an official, uh, an active official at the table to to talk about whether or not a rule that they're considering can be officiated. The trainers are represented from a player safety standpoint, the commissioners are represented from an administration standpoint, yada, 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 but the voting members are coaches. Now I think a lot of people don't know that. I think a lot of people feel like that the officials make the, make the rules and then the coaches complain about them. The other coaches complain about the, so the rules that the coaches on the committee made if it, if it impacts them. I mean, you talk about self-interest rearing its ugly head from time to time. This happens all the time. And, and uh, but uh, the other thing that I, that had occurred to me, and I, we were talking about this outside earlier. There, the, the, we're in a bi we're in a, a, a two-year rule change process now, which is fairly new. It used to be that the committee met and changed rules every year. For some reason, and I don't know how this happened, there has, has grown up an expectation that the rules are going to get changed. That something's going to get changed every year, and it's it is it is very unusual. In fact, the, one of the first questions I always get after the Rules Committee meets in February, what are you guys changing this year? As if to say, we know something's going to get changed, let us in on it. Now compare that with baseball. The rules of baseball have hardly changed at all. The designated hitter in the American League, I forget when that came in, it's been in a long time now, but the designated hitter in the American League is pro and, and expanding the schedule from 154 to 162 games, but I mean, that's not how the game is played. <clears throat> In terms of how the game is played, the rules of baseball have hardly changed at all. And it's a, it's a big deal when, if, if, when, when baseball changes a rule. Baseball relies very heavily on statistics, on being able to compare numbers from one era to the next. 
And, and if you talk about uh, Albert Pujols, comparing him to Mickey Mantle, comparing him to Babe Ruth, there's at least some, some sort of common set of things, rules that, that, that are in place, and there is no expectation that the rules of baseball are ever going to change. But there's an expectation that football rules are going to change. Now, I, th I think that it probably, it probably has to do as much as anything with the fact that the game itself has changed. The rules of football, and I don't know to what extent this happens in, in your world or not, but the rules of football sort of are always behind. We're always catching up with how the game is actually played. Um, the, the, the rules for holding, for example, you hear people say, you can call holding on every play, and that's probably right. But the rules for holding have, have evolved over time to be more a reflection of how the game is played. The forward pass. The first time the forward, it's, it's a little bit hard to find exactly the first time a forward pass was used in the game, but when the, when the forward pass was first used in the game, it was, it wasn't, there wasn't any rule against it. The rules were just silent about it. And so when the forward pass was first used, people scratched their heads and said, what the heck was that? Was that okay? And the referee <laughs> said, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it was no more complicated than that. And so that, well, think about how, <clears throat> how many of you follow college football at all? watch it on TV or think about it or read about it. Whatever. I mean, think about the forward pass. I mean, it's a huge part of the game. The pros now, my goodness, running backs are almost a, a, you know, an endangered species in the NFL. I mean, it's all, it's all throwing the ball. And so, uh, so the, the game is always catching up with itself. Technology, I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a second, but technology has impacted the game mainly through instant replay, but it's also impacted how we look at the game. If you, when you watch a game on television and the, and the high definition, slow-mo, 19 camera angles on everything on a play where an official has to make a decision in a microsecond, uh, you know, it's, it's very, it makes it a very different game in terms of watching it, in terms of officiating it. And the video, I mean, if a play, if a play happens and there's something, something unusual about it or something controversial about it, it's on YouTube in 10 minutes. You know, I mean, so, there, so there's no, you know, there's no, uh, I used to, when I was, when I was refereeing in the, in the old Southwest Conference, and sometimes in the early days when I was refereeing in the Southeastern Conference, I could, I could go two or three weeks and not have a game on television. I mean, I could say I was, I was sort of laboring in obscurity. Nobody, I could screw this up and nobody knew, you know. <laughs> well, now every game is on national television. Every game in the Southeastern Conference is on national television. You can sit down on Saturday morning, starting at about 11 o'clock, and go all the way to midnight and watch nonstop games, and there are a lot of them that you're obviously not able to see. And with, ESP, with all the platforms that ESPN has now, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPNU, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, I mean, ESPN is, owns our lives. And so, um, so the game is, the, the rules are always trying to catch up with this stuff. So the rules are always gonna be a little bit behind the technology, and they're also always trying to, to, to anticipate what, you know, what, what's going to be needed to, to, to change. Um, how do rules happen? Uh, there's several things that come into play. One is just the notion of, of, of fairness, of perceived fairness. Uh, is, this, is this game fair? Are we, one of the things about that's, that's become an issue over the last five or six years is, is blocks that are below the waist. Knees are getting blown out because a player's uh, blocking below the waist. Players always, have always done this, but uh, it's become more dangerous as players have gotten faster. Now, enough of you know about physics to know that energy goes as a square of the speed. And there's a lot of kinetic energy flying around the football field. The players are big, yeah, but the fact that they're fast is the thing that has changed the game so much. I can watch a game I got some of the games I used to do on, on video, and I can go back and watch a game I did 10 years ago, and it looks like the players are running in sand. I mean, it, compared with today, it really is amazing how the game has changed in terms of the speed. And so, blocking below the waist has got to be a very dangerous play because the players are so much faster. So they're hitting each other with such greater impact because of the speed. And so, there's got to be some sort of a, a balance about a balance between offense and defense. You don't want you don't want a game you don't want games that are going you know. 75 to 63, but you also don't want a bunch of, you know, six to nothing games either. So there's got to be a balance between offense and defense. Excitement. Uh, you may have seen <coughs> last year um, when the, the player at Rutgers 
a player named Legrand got hurt on a, on a kickoff, paralyzed on a kickoff. The coach at Rutgers, Greg Schiano, has proposed taking the kickoff out of the game. And people say, oh my God, you can't do that. It's tradition, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's some tradition. I mean, they didn't have it back in, you know, in 1869, so how, how you know. But it, it, it's an exciting play. And part of the reason it's an exciting play is because it's a dangerous play. I mean, let's face it, people don't go to NASCAR to watch the cars go around the track. They watch to go to watch for wrecks, right? <laughs> I mean, people go to, I know hockey's a wonderful sport, but th there's a thrill when a fight breaks out, you know. Well, I mean, I, I think part of the reason that, that, that the kickoff is an exciting play is because it's somewhat dangerous. There's some risk involved. And so uh, there's a lot of tradition involved. Athletic prowess, these players are very gifted athletes. I mean, it's incredible how gifted these players are in terms of their athletic ability. And uh, so you want to you wanna have rules that allow that to, to express itself. Um, as I said earlier, reflection of how the game is played, we're always catching up with technology. Lots of stakeholders have an interest in this. TV. TV is a big driver of, of the game. If you, if you think about, if you watch NFL, an NFL game will go almost exactly three hours. <laughs> almost exactly. And they've got their TV time slots in three hour segments. And they've designed the rules of the game. The rules of NFL are a little bit different from college, the clock rules in particular. And they've got the clock rules now to such a fine tuned point that they can almost play a game in exactly three hours. Now college, we're a little more loosey goosey about this. Games will go 315, 320. But, but uh, the TV is a, is a big stakeholder. Now TV is part of the problem because they have these long commercials. You know, if you're, if you're sitting in a stadium and there's a commercial break, oh my gosh, what is going on? Let's get back to it. You know, if you're at home watching it, you can record the game and fast forward through that, or you can go to the restroom or, you know, go get a beer out of the refrigerator or something like that during this three minute commercial. Well, there's a lot of those three minute commercials in a game, and, but TV's paying the bill, so everybody says, oh yes, we'll do whatever you want us to do. But it, there's a lot of stakeholders here, the, the conferences, the commissioners, you've seen all the stuff about conference breakups and conference realignment. So there's a lot of interest in, the, in those stakeholders and what the rules of the game are. Uh, personal biases of the committee members. I mean, we're human beings and people on the committee, if some, if some coach on the committee feels like last year he got beat because of some rule that he doesn't like, then he'll try to persuade people to change it. And sometimes it's no more complicated than that. And if that particular person had not been on the committee, probably wouldn't have gotten that rule change. So, you know, personal self-interest does uh, rear itself from time to time. Um, I, I mentioned the, the stakeholders, and I want to, I want to, I talked about some of this, but American Football Coaches Association, <coughs> this is a huge organization because it includes all college coaches as well as all high school coaches. And when they descend on a city, I mean, it is, a big, it is a big thing, and so they have to, you know, they, they can only go to places that accommodate big conventions and all that. But they have a rules committee of their own. I meet with them twice a year. It's not an official body, but it's a very influential body. All the big name coaches are on this committee. Uh, conference commissioners, I mentioned some of these. The trainers are always at the table because they're, they're, they're everybody's concerned about player safety, but these guys know what they're talking about. And so the athletics trainers, that's a whole sub area of, of medicine and uh, sports medicine is a big deal. And these trainers, television and the print media, uh, the field officials are there uh, to, 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 to say, yeah, we can officiate this play or no, you know, there's no point in passing this rule because it'd be impossible to officiate. So there are a lot of stakeholders here that are influential on how, how the rules take place. I've got an example of, uh, I, wanna, I wanna show you about, about how the rules get changed. And, uh, and this, this goes back a little bit in history. <coughs> Newt Rockney played at Notre Dame and then was a very famous coach at Notre Dame in the, in the 20s. And he introduced what he called the, the Notre Dame shift. Now, now football uses words in a, in a particular way. A shift in football means you got two people moving at the same time. If one player moves, that's not called a shift. I mean, in everyday language, you might call it that. But in football, if, a player is, if two players are moving at the same time, <coughs> that's what's called a shift. And so Rockney introduced this shift, and I'm going to show you this piece of video. Let's see if I can get this done.
somewhere. There it is. Every day. As a coach, however, he emphasized brains, deception, and speed. Football today is a contest of wits more than anything else. Back in the old days, it was a contest of power, nothing but sheer power. The things that have made that speed and deception the major factor are open formation, shifting, open plays, and tactical maneuvers. Uh, that weren't known no, the when it, watch when they do the shift when they line up in a minute, you'll Our see how quickly they move. The successful tactical maneuver was the famous Notre Dame shift. Shift. One, two, three, four, 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 three, two, six, seven, show you in, in addition to the, the entertainment value obviously but um, was the fact that when they when they did that shift if you notice what they would do they would um, they would move they would come to the line and they move and then snap the ball very quickly well what the rules committee did in 1924 was say the players have to come to a complete stop before the ball is snapped now, it sounds like a subtle thing, but if you watch what they were doing, they were just moving and the ball snapped. And, and it was hard to adjust the defense. And in 1927, they made the players come to a, a stop for a full second. And that rule has persisted to today. Now, there are not 50 coaches in America that can tell you why the rule is there. But nobody challenges it. It's really interesting. I mean, if, if it happens in a game... And, and we call it, and the coach says, oh, gee, we shouldn't have done that. But nobody wonders, why do we have this rule? And Rockney always felt like, I mean, Notre Dame was very successful, so he felt picked on. So Rockney felt like, well, this rule was instituted because I'm so successful. And it may well have been. I mean, I can imagine that these guys sitting on the rules committee thinking, boy, Notre Dame is wiping everybody out with this crazy shift. We've got to do something about that. And so that's what happened. So that's, a, that's one of the ways that rules get changed because people feel like that there's some perceived inequity or somebody just so successful that they don't they can't stand it uh, the two things that are of major concern are player safety and player behavior and this taunting and showboating has got to be a real issue for college football and coaches are very concerned about it and I'm going to I'll talk about that in a second but I mentioned the, the speed and the size of the players I mean the speed I'm going to emphasize that again the speed is a thing that is so different about the game and you get you got there's got to be an upper limit to that somewhere but I mean uh, uh, you know it, it's amazing how fast these guys are and the player behavior has gotten has gotten to be uh, a bit of a problem as well I'm going to show you a couple of clips to illustrate this is uh, uh, an example of um, of a play that um, can do this Watch this receiver. Three flags. I went too far. I want to go back and show. Let's show. I want to show this play. I feel like I'm looking in the mirror, guys. Watch this receiver right here. The defenseless player 
This is uh, a training film I made for my right conference. There. And you can see the defender launches. Uh, he's well off the ground, uh, comes right into his head. That's, a, that's trying to leave a calling card. There's no way that that is just simply trying to make a tackle. And we should have had a, at least one flag down on the play, and hopefully two, because we've got the head linesman apparently looking right at it. And then the, the, the key, the, the official who has that uh, receiver as the key is the, is the side judge, and we should have, he's looking right at it as well. So we should have had a flag down that play, potentially an ejection. I mean, this is just about as dangerous as it gets, and I'm very concerned that we, that we missed this. Well, uh, so those are two examples of, of, of the kind of thing that, that we're seeing more of these days. And a, and a few years ago, the, the Rules Committee put in a rule, and, and we, we talked for a day about how this language should be framed, because you got, there's always going to be this standing tension between football as a hard collision sport on the one hand and the safety of the players on the other hand. And so the, rule, the Rules Committee framed this rule around targeting, the idea being that, like in these two plays, the player on defense is not just trying to make a tackle. I mean, he's trying to, to de decapitate the guy. And so we put in a rule about targeting, making, making it illegal, about targeting a defenseless player. And it, it's, had, it's had some impact, I think. Um, the one that's taunting, the showboating one, I want to I show you this one. Um, and let me preface this by saying this is another one of those sort of standing tension things. This is a game played by teenagers. They're gifted. And they're tremendously athletic. But they're teenagers. And teenagers, I'm sorry, some of you are teenagers, Bob, but teenagers make bad decisions. I mean, that's why drivers, that's why car insurance is more expensive for teenagers than it is for adults, because they make bad decisions. And these are teenagers, they make bad decisions. And so, uh, they, and, and also, what's, what's happened over time, and this started with Mark Gastineau with the Jets back 20 years ago or so, uh, celebrating uh, a, a good play. Now, what we want to allow is this sort of youthful exuberance, excitement over having done something great, but when it gets to taunting an opponent or demeaning or showing off or a vulgarity or something like that, then, then that's beyond the pale. And so the coaches are very concerned about the image of the game in terms of, of these kinds of, of plays. Now watch that. This is an easy one. This is an easy one to call. I can find the... Who should we keep our eye on? Uh, it'll be so obvious you want to. <laughs> Trust me, you will not miss it. If I can ever get to it. Ah. Well. I can't find it. Is that it? Yeah, there it is. Coming back to the third and nine. Across the middle, complete to Brown. He's got the first down, turns the corner. Midfield cuts back, and he's going to go and tie this game. Antonio. <laughs> 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 So you didn't have to have me point him out to um, I'm not sure if he was waving or shooting a bird. Wh whichever it was, it was a taunting foul. Now, here's the change that, was that took place. Last year, when this happened, the touchdown counts, even though the foul takes place while he's still, before he's crossed the goal line, so the ball's still alive. But the touchdown counts, and this was what we would refer to as a, a live ball foul treated as a dead ball foul. In other words, in terms of enforcing the penalty, we behave as if it happened after the touchdown. So. There would be sort of this meaningless penalty either on the extra point or on the kickoff. Starting in 2011, that play would not have, there would have been no touchdown. The, the penalty would have been enforced from the spot of the foul and backed about 15 yards and been first down. Now, the, 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 when, so this was announced in 2010 to take place in 2011 because the committee wanted everybody to kind of let the steam go out of it for a, a while, let everybody get used to the idea. And I got calls from people saying, oh, you're taking the excitement out of the game, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe. But what the coaches were concerned about, football is a team game. This guy's behaving as if what he did was all entirely him. And, and take the other 10 players out of the play, out of his teammates out, how far would he have gotten? Those kinds of things. And so, plus, 
the notion of, I mean, the, the, the coaches are very, very serious about sportsmanship. Now, sometimes you can't tell it by the way they behave. <laughs> I mean, coaches' behavior on the sidelines has got to be a real problem, and we don't have to address that. But the, in terms of the players, uh, this kind of demeaning attitude and taunting the opponents and all that sort of thing is, 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 off the, is, is beyond the pale. And so the way, the way the committee framed it, and I really like this, this year, this, it's okay in 2010, but currently, the player has chosen to relinquish the touchdown in favor of doing whatever it is he's doing. Now, he doesn't think about it like that, but, but and, and it's been interesting, there's only been two this year in all of college football, and last year there was a lot of these where a player was in the field of play, still the ball still alive, and he'd do this. There was one in the game in Buffalo early in the year, and what happened on that play was he did a similar thing they got the ball, the touchdown did not count. They backed him up 15 yards, and on the first play from scrimmage, they threw an interception. So not only did they not get the touchdown, they didn't even keep the football. The one that everybody saw, because it was in a nationally televised game, LSU in Florida, about a month ago, the LSU player did a, a, it wasn't a big deal, but it was enough of a taunt to, to flag it. And so what helped us there was Les Miles, the LSU coach, came out and said, his player that did it, he said, that's a great call. If I was the official, I'd make the same call. And so usually the coaches are, are in favor of it for somebody else, you know, but, you know, but don't tax me. But, uh, but in that case, it, it, it helps. So uh, I think the rule has helped. Uh, we've got a lot fewer unsportsmanlike conduct fouls this year than we had last year. So I, I show that as an illustration of how the rules are made and how they, how they change with regard to, to how the game is played. The, the, um, I'm about to run out of time. The instant replay is really the, the impact of technology uh, and, and has, it's probably the major rules change that, that has impacted the game itself. Uh, the, the Big Ten did this as an experiment in 2004. The, the Rules Committee will, will occasionally allow a conference to experiment with a rule. And so they must get approval of the committee and all that. But the Big Ten experimented with it in 2004. The technology, was, even then, even as, as few years ago as that, the technology was was, was not as robust as it is now. They were using TiVos, uh, and uh, this was adopted as a rule change in 2005, and all the Division I schools in the football bowl subdivision, the one AA schools, are using it now. High definition, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. And, uh, uh, you know, you can, reasonable people can disagree about whether or not it's been good for the game. I think the coaches are pretty happy with it. It's not as intrusive on the game as we thought it was going to be. There, there'll be we, a, we still average fewer than two stoppages a game to review a play. Every play is reviewed. Every play is reviewed, but not, obviously not every play is reviewed to the extent of stopping the game to review it. So I think probably we can talk about instant replay if you want to. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to stop there, and maybe we can turn the lights up, and I'd be glad to take questions, comments. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, really appreciate the talk. Uh, Thank you. You said one of the last points you made was really interesting that the rules committee will let a division experiment. Oh, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, you said that uh, the rules committee will let a division experiment with a rule. How long is that trial period? And are there any rules being experimented with right now? There are not. The question, in case you didn't hear it, is about experimenting with rules, and the rules committee will allow. Typically, it's a conference not a whole division, but a conference to experiment with the rule. And we will allow it for, uh, for a year and then evaluate whether or not it would be, uh, and there, there are none now. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we experimented a few years ago, this was not a rule really, this is a, me a football mechanics, uh, is having, um, um, when, 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 when you see a, a field goal being attempted or an extra point being attempted, you'll see two officials standing, one official under each upright. And, and it used to be that that's, that's the back judge and the side judge. It used to be that the field judge really didn't have anything to do. So we brought him in to be kind of a second umpire behind the, behind the linebacker. So that was an experiment, not a rule thing, but that was an experiment on how, how the game is officiated. That was done for one year. Now we do it all the time on field goals and extra points. So that's an example. Um, instant replay, um, I'm trying to think if there's another example. It, it, they happen very seldom. It's, it's, not a, it's not a routine thing at all. Right here. I mean, football is as much about athleticism as it is about technology in a lot of ways, right? So, um, <coughs> thinking about the speed problem, 
And would there be a way for like maybe the armor that they wear is heavier or something? Like, has anyone ever thought about like slowing the game down so that some of the safety problems just go away? Uh, uh, did you hear the question? Um, I, I, that's a very interesting idea that I had never thought about. I think, I, I think it's less likely to to fly, just because part of the part of what part of the rules process is to allow the expression of the athleticism. Speed is an important part of that, and so I, I, my my thought about that has been, I think that 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 the that the sh the hard shell helmet has been a dangerous introduction to the game for two reasons, maybe more than two reasons. But first of all, when a guy, like, like you saw in those, in those videos, when a guy launches himself, he becomes a missile. And here's the, the warhead, you know. And, uh, and, and teenagers feel like they're indestructible anyway. Now you put this missile on their head. <laughs> I mean, they really do. And so, so the, the, there's, a, there's a part of the targeting rule is a rule that, that says you cannot target an opponent with the crown of the helmet. And the reason for that is you can, you can imagine. You know, you, you hit, physicists understand this, you know, the, the, the head hits, the body keeps on going. And so the head gets shoved down between the shoulders. That's what happened to the Rutgers kid. And so the, the, fact, of, the fact of the hard helmet, not only is it a weapon, it makes the players feel like that they are more protected. And if they, are, if they didn't feel as much protected, they have gotten into the habit of ducking the head. When I was playing football in high school 50 years ago, we were taught, keep your head up, see what you're hitting. And the trainers still say that, keep the head up. In fact, they put out this whole video. It's called Heads Up. And it, and it means, it's a pun there, you know, pay attention, but it also means keep your head up when you hit what you're hitting because that way you're less likely to drive your head and neck down between your shoulders. The notion of loading people up with a heavier uniform to deliberately slow them down, I, it's a great idea. I just think it won't fly because it's not going to be. Uh, it's, it won't be as exciting. Yeah, these right, guys right. Moving yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it just won't. I don't know how to take these. Maybe somebody else. I'll decide who gets the questions. But yeah, uh, actually, yeah. I just uh, I have a question, but I also like that that's really interesting because I you see that in other sports that sometimes. The safety measures that have been taken make the game more dangerous because people become more reckless. That's exactly so right. That's a great is point. To you is That's right. It it, inter it introduces the unintended consequences. It introduces a a recklessness. That's yeah. right. So I, I just wanted to follow up on that and ask if you could talk a little bit about equipment um, and how that's changed and and um, and rules about equipment and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The equipment has changed quite a bit. There's, I mean, and the and the, the equipment designers. I mean, I mean, the Rawlings and you Under Armour and and Adidas and Nike and all those guys. I mean, they're making tons of money with this stuff. Because, but the, there's a, there's a lot more padding, a lot more soft padding. One of the things about the helmets that is a good thing, they're cushioned on the inside more, and they are, but and they're inflated. Now, if if you notice, if you watch a football game sometimes, how many times helmets come off during a game without being ripped off by the opponent. And, and in fact, we're keeping count of that this year because the Rules Committee last year talked about putting in some kind of rule to make it something like if a player's helmet came off and he didn't, and wasn't pulled off by opponent, he might have to sit down and play or should be charged with a timeout or something like that. And so we wanted to get a size of the problem, so we're counting them this year. Watch a player go to the sideline sometime. He just takes his helmet and kind of flips it off, you know. Or when he picks it up by the, by the headgear and kind of whoop, and it goes on as easy as a gimme cap. You know, well, it used to be, and I'm not so old that, I mean, a lot of other people that have played the game will say, used to be to take that helmet, you and to get it off, you you know, well, now it's just, Ugh. and so it's, it's become less of a, a, and so the equipment design has probably uh, had the opposite effect. I mean, the idea of what they think is that the players are, are letting the air out of those cushions inside so that the helmet doesn't fit as tight. The shoulder pads, have been much more, much more cushiony. I guess if I had to word, right, say one word that, in, that, that describes all this stuff, it's cushiony. There's more, there's more give, there's more cushion, there's not the hard shell, shoulder pads. The shell is there, but it's still, there's more cushion, there's more give, more, more idea of, of, but the helmet itself is, uh, 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 and in concussions, you know, you may have read in the, in the newspapers, NFL is doing a long-term, a longitudinal study on the impact of, 
not just concussions, but continuous head uh, line play. And they're, what they're discovering is that players who in their, that are in their 50s now uh, are disproportionately larger number of them are showing the early onsets of dementia, uh, early onsets of Alzheimer's. And so there's a very a lot of concern about things that you, you would never, it, it never see as a concussion, never see as an injury, but just the sort of the over and over and over and over again of that brain rattling around inside the, the skull. So uh, shoes have changed a lot, shoes have changed a lot, design of shoes has changed. Um, so it's, it's, it's advanced and, and in most cases it's gotten a lot better. In my view the helmet has is, is, is gone the other direction. Well, you know, there's supposed to be, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of rules. I can show you the rule book. There's a lot of rules that talk about how the, how the helmets have to be designed and, 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 you know, what the jerseys are supposed to look like and what the knee pads are supposed to be and how the cleats, the most expensive rule in football, this is, go figure this out. <coughs> if the cleats are longer than a half an inch, is that right? I forget the numbers now. I haven't seen it because nobody violates this rule anymore. The most expensive rule in the game is if the cleats are longer than a certain length, the player is ejected from the game and he can't play the next game. Now, he may not have done anything but walk on the field with these oversized cleats, but so, uh, I'm, I, so many. One of, one of you referee this, Frank. And I was just curious, you talk about the influence of the media and we all know in this industry that these sports games, including football, sports games have gotten more and more popular so there, is there anybody sitting on these commissions from the video game industry and what kinds of things do they bring up if so? Uh, not from the game industry that's very interesting uh, I, and I, I don't know to what extent, you, you will know better than I do to what extent fantasy football is I know it's big for NFL games I don't know to what extent it's big for college games is, is it also big for college games and, and the video games that show the action you know the, the, the likeness of the players uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that's happening, this is a, a marketing thing or a money issue, but one of the interesting things that's happening is that the likeness of Cam Newton, the last year's Heisman Trophy winner, in some video game, somebody's making tons of money out of that. Cam Newton's getting nothing out of that. And so that's an issue for, that's not what you're talking about, but, any, but the, I guess to answer the question is the, 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 the presence of the video game industry or the fantasy game industry with the rules committee just hasn't happened. We um, pass back to the last one. Uh, Rogers, thank you for this. I'm a <coughs> lifelong Miami Hurricanes fan, so this is, uh, I hope your colleagues will be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, so much of what you're talking about, there's this, uh, there's this it's characterized by change over time. And um, I know this is in, strictly speaking, your area of expertise, but I'm very curious about your opinion um, as far as the rules and how they haven't changed uh, in the area of amateur status. And you were you touched on that just now about the, you know, uh, the Cam Newton thing. But, uh, you know, like eSports are sort of coming into their own a little bit and you have people who are age-wise um, even younger uh, than some of the people who are playing college football. And yet they're being remunerated. They're they're making money, and that is in many ways I think a sign of the legitimacy that people can make a living doing this. And there are any, there are all these reasons that uh, are put forth for players not being compensated uh, for playing college football. And I personally feel increasingly like they are valid. Um, and I know that it's it would be very complicated to start paying players, but I, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, um, I, th I have to confess, I think different things on different days about that. I mean, um, I, I understand the, the idea that, that, um, that college athletes are under a different set of rules than students in the university who are not NCAA athletes. I mean, when I was a college professor, if a student came to me and said, Dr. Redding, I gotta, can, I, can I borrow $50? My grandmother died, and i got to go home. I wouldn't hesitate to do that. But if that was a football player, I could, get, I could get myself fired. I could get the university in huge trouble with the NCAA, that kind of thing. So, but, but you can understand the reason for it, and the reason for it is you would not believe 
the, the, the passion that the boosters um, have and the way that they're willing to, talk, well, the Miami situation with uh, Shapiro. Uh, and one of the great icons of this whole process is this picture of Donna Shalala uh, salivating over this $50,000 check that Shapiro has handed her. Now that's an unfortunate picture, but it, but it, it, it illustrates the fact that there's so much money and so much stuff being thrown at these guys, the whole Ohio State thing, that cost Jim Trestle his job. He made some very bad decisions. So if, we, if you start, I, I think it's a slippery slope, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that if you start paying players in addition to whatever scholarship uh, they have, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna open up a whole nother realm of regulation. It's gonna hope, open up a whole nother realm of, of scrutiny because I mean, bad money's gonna follow good. That's just the way it is. And so I, th I, think th I, th I think there's a terrible inequity that the players are playing a game that generates for the television networks huge amounts of money, that generates for the universities lots of money, although most athletic departments operate in the red, quite frankly. And so uh, it's, it's hard to know how much the universities are getting out of this, but the TV networks are, are, are just becoming wealthy, and a lot of that money's being poured back into into the game and all that. So, but the players are kind of caught in the middle here. The other, the other stakeholder that, that I did not mention in, the, in who has an influence on the rules is the players of the game. They have no influence on the rules other than what they can, uh, other what they can communicate to their coaches. I mean, I see that put forward as a potential solution that players would have some kind of either collective or individual representation in the process. Yeah, one of the things that, that I've, I'm, I'm glad you said that because one of the things that I, that I want to do, and I, I, could, I think I can just unilaterally do this, is have a player or two present in the rules committee uh, when the conversations are being had. I mean, I think to have, to have that would be a, a positive impact. Now, you, you get into the thing, okay, which players and which division and yada, 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 but to have a couple of players there, I think, just to, if for no other reason than just to say, you know, we care about what you think. We may not do what you say, ask us to do, but we care about what you think, and it does fold it into the conversation. Another thing, uh, aside from uh, paying the players, just let them major in sports. There's an interesting Washington Post uh, uh, op-ed um, where this woman was talking about the idea that why can't a talented fo a college football player be majoring in that sport? Mm -hmm. is it, why is it okay for someone to major in dance and train and to become a, a brilliant dancer when you can't yeah. major in football yeah. to train to become I, a brilliant I think that's, I, I, yeah. I like that idea as much as anything about uh, paying the players. Uh, Frank We're is- We're gonna start that program at NYU, right? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to a few more questions. Who else has, raise your hands right now and just let me see. Okay, so we'll get we'll get two, two or three more, and then uh, you talked a lot about the uh, rules and how they've changed since the inception of football, and uh, you mentioned a couple rules that people don't know why they're there, but they, they just always have been. Um, has it ever? Uh, do people think about it and would, it? would you think the sport would benefit from maybe just somebody sitting down and just rewriting rules from scratch and saying this is what we want? You know, this is what football's about. This is what we, how we want it to behave, and kind of making a new clean rule set. Here's the question. Um, yeah, I, I uh, um, this is, an, you know, this process now is enough like herding cats. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure that that might, I, I, I take the point. And, but it, it's interesting, um, it, it, when, you, when, you instant, when you talk about making it, I mean, even if, we, even if we change the shift play, the one I showed with Rockney, if we were to change that, people would say, oh my gosh, you're messing with the tradition of the game, you know. And so I, I, I take the point that it might not be a bad idea to say, time out, let's take a year and just look at what, what is it we want the game to be. We go back to the original idea of, of advancing a ball beyond a landmark. That's the idea of the game. And so then we got into all these things about how that's done. I think you're always going to get into this, this balance between um, uh, the offense and defense, uh, continuing to have a place for the little man in the game. Now, the little man now is 280 pounds, but I mean, uh, a, a place for the little man in the game, those kinds of things, people worry about that. I think things that, that keep the game sharp looking, the alignments, the lack of, of, of this goofy you know, motion and stuff, I think that's, 
to me, that's aesthetically pleasing. It, 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 doesn't, Im, it doesn't impair the game at all. Now, the, if any of you watch Canadian football, you'll, you'll know that they can, they can be moving toward the line of scrimmage at the snap. So they'll time this thing. They'll run a back back here, and they'll time it so that by the time he gets to the line of scrimmage and the ball snap, he's got a full head of steam. He's not starting from a standstill start. One of the things the NFL did with the, foot, with the kickoff this year was to make it so that the kicking team could not be deeper than five yards from the ball when it was kicked. The idea being to cut down on the amount of momentum that they've got when the ball is kicked. And so that was a player safety kind of thing. NFL committee, by the way, toyed with the idea of doing away with the kickoff altogether because their, their data show that concussions happen way disproportionately high on kickoffs compared with any other play in the game. That's a little off of your question, but I, I take the point. Um, I have two questions that are pretty related. Uh, obviously, the NFL is the biggest sport, even though everyone knows college football is better. Um, Thank you. But they, they make rule changes, and there's, there's some small rule changes between the two sports. The most significant one was in action last night with overtime. The overtime format, for anyone who doesn't know, in the NFL is sudden death. The first person to score wins, and if it ends 15 minutes, ends, it's a tie. In NCAA, both teams get a chance to like score, and if both are tied after that, then they try again, and they keep doing that. And so you had a situation last night where Stanford USC kept scoring touchdowns until the very, very end of the game. Um, I was in a five overtime game one time. Oh, wow. Yeah, no. I, I, I was I dead. I, I, I want to get paid by the hour. <laughs> <laughs> so when the NFL makes rule changes, obviously they're the, they're the, bigger, they're the bigger sport in terms of just money and, and, and watches. Like, how much do you guys uh, take that into account for rule changes? And a specific rule that I'm interested in is – why has the pass interference penalty not been moved to a spot foul on uh, any, any penalty versus the 15-yard foul in college versus the NFL? Right, okay. Did you hear the question? Okay. Um, there's several questions in there. One is, we do pay attention to that. The, I, as the Secretary Rules Editor, I sit with, the, they call it the Competition Committee, which is the name of the committee of the, of the NFL. I sit with them every year. Um, tough duty. It's a week in Naples. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> With, a, with a, a meeting room, a tent on the beach, I mean, this is, these guys know how to live, trust me. Um, so we do pay attention. They want to know, they've come our way on a few things. If you, if, you know, if you remember, it used to be in the NFL if a guy went up for a pass and got hit and was driven out of bounds, if he would have come down in bounds, it would have been a completion. Now it's the NCAA rule. So they've come our way on that one. Um, we've gone their way on a few things. One of the things that's different about the NFL is they have a very... How many NFL teams are there? 32. 32. So they've got 32 teams, and they can control that environment. They, they control the TV. They control everything. And so that makes it a lot easier to institute a rule that's going to be consistently across the board. You know, NCAA has got all these divisions, hundreds of teams, hundreds of coaches, hundreds of different venues, vastly different games on national television versus a Division Three game before a thousand people, so there's all those kinds of, of differences. Uh, the specific rule change that you ask about the pass, the pass, interference. pass interference, yeah, pass interference. What he's talking about is in the pros, if there's a pass interference foul, it is what we refer to as a spot foul. That means at the spot where the foul took place, that's where the ball is for first down. It used to be that way in college. Are you are you old enough to remember when it was that way in college? Actually, no, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, it used to be that way in college, and, and what, we, what they found was that they felt like that that was, again, this balance between offense and defense, they felt like it was too expensive. And so now the way the rule in college is that if the foul takes place more than 15 yards from the line of scrimmage, it's a 15-yard penalty. If it takes place fewer than 15 yards, then it's a spot foul. So it's a first down at the spot of the foul. So it's, it's either the spot of the foul or a maximum of 15. There's no talk about going the other direction. Um, one more, sir. Uh, this is out of curiosity as someone uh, who's not very familiar with American football, but um, are there regional variations in playing surfaces and playing styles within the U.S.? Because certainly in, in rugby, there's a tension in the rules between the way the game is played in, say, South Africa, where the pitches are very hard, mm -hmm. and they're often playing at high altitude where the ball moves through the air more quickly, and so it favors a, a running fast moving game as opposed to in the UK where it's cold and the ground is very soggy and it's it favors big heavy guys playing what's known as the stick it <laughs> raining up the all the time yeah, and all. the stick yeah. it up the jumper style <laughs> of, uh, rugby. Um, and, I gotta uh, remember I that wondered, I just wondered if that if 
does that ha is there any of that in the way that American football is operated? Uh, there, there are there are regional differences in styles of play, and, and and let me set that aside for a second. There are not the regional differences in surfaces, other than the weather. I mean, weather. You know, if you play a game in in Buffalo versus playing a game in Austin, Texas. I mean, obviously you're going they're gonna be some differences. But in terms of the surface itself. Now, the, wh where you do get differences is the sort of a resource issue. The Division I guys, the wealthy guys, can have all these fancy surfaces with drainage and, you know, the little fire, tire pellets bouncing up, you know, the, the, the synthetic combination of synthetic and non-synthetic grass versus, you know, some Division Three school that's going to play on grass forever. So there, is those, there are those kinds of things. The, the regional differences in styles of play has been reduced a lot because there's so much intersectional play now. It used to be the Big Ten was three yards in a cloud of dust. You know, there was, there was you know, carry the ball, not much passing, as distinct from what, what some, you'll, you'll still hear people refer to, so so-and-so runs a West Coast offense. What that means is spread out, lots of passing, lots of variations of formations, those kinds of things. But because, you know, because Connecticut plays UCLA now, or because Notre Dame plays Southern Cal or because LSU plays Oregon, there's less of that because they steal ideas from each other. So I think there's a much more, um, there's much more homogeneity, if I can say it that way, of styles of play than there was even 10 or 15 years ago. But you still see, you still see a little more on the West Coast, a little more open. I think it's a lot, you know, California, hey, you know, <laughs> Whereas Alabama, you know, you know. so it, there is, there are those kinds of cultural differences that that express themselves in all kinds of ways. And I and I think football. I mean, like any sport, I think football is is as much an expression of culture as 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 anything. I mean, you talk about the passion of fans. People go crazy over over way too much. I mean, it's off the charts. You know, people are the 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 the, the blessing is the curse. The blessing is they're passionate about the game and they love it so much. The curse is they're so passionate about the game that it just rules their lives and it's just a little crazy. Yeah. And I think maybe um, we'll we'll wrap it up there. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll so be around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.